Good morning, everybody. I'm Liz and Doy. I want to welcome you to Art at Home, sponsored by the Hoboken Library. Thank you so much to the library for sponsoring this class and many of the arts in Hoboken during the period of pandemic and sheltering at home during COVID-19. It's a really wonderful thing that the Hoboken Library has done. We are beginning the month of July, and I have a theme for every month for Art at Home. And the theme for July is French speaking and French American artists. Because in July, we have the 4th of July, obviously, but we also have Flag Day, the French or the French Independence Day, Bastille Day. We also have, you know, Flag Day is in June, right? American Flag Day. So forgive me for that era, but we have Bastille Day and we have the 4th of July. And we have this long time connection with France. General Lafayette came and helped us fight during the Revolutionary War. And of course we have the Statue of Liberty. And now we have the smaller sister Statue of Liberty that uh, has just been given to us by France. So it seems fitting for us to look at the work of French American and French speaking artists during the month of July. Our first artist, for the month is an artist near and dear to my heart. Her name is Louise Bourgeois. She has such incredibly interesting, eclectic, wide ranging work. Bourgeois was born in France in Paris in 1911. She lived a long and very creative life. She died in 2010 at the age of 99 and she worked right up until her death. Um, she was incredibly prolific. Her work ranged from paintings and drawings and printmaking to sculpture and installation. She's probably most famous for her sculpture and installations. And she worked with a variety of themes and, and concepts and ideas in her work. So ideas range from everything from domesticity to issues of family and sexuality in the human body. She explored the idea of death and the unconscious in her work as well. Her work was deeply psychological. She thought of her art as being therapy, self-therapy. She suffered from insomnia her entire life and spent many, many, many hours um, throughout the night drawing. And she had countless notebooks filled with what she called her insomnia drawings. Years ago, there was a wonderful show. I think it was, was it at the Guggenheim? Maybe one of you might remember of her insomnia drawings that were really, really wonderful. Uh, she, as I said, she was born in Paris. She was moved with her family uh, when she was three to a suburb outside of Paris where they opened a workshop to restore tapestries. When they had lived in Paris, they had a gallery where they sold tapestries, but then they opened this shop where they restored tapestries and sold tapestries and they lived above the tapestry shop. A bourgeois in her early life learned to repair the damaged tapestries. She fell in love with fabric at that point in her life and it really became a lifelong love affair for her. Fabric, uh, threads, all of that was something that she enjoyed working with throughout her life. In 1930 she entered the Sorbonne and this is something incredibly different in Bourgeois from any other artist I think we've talked about so far. She entered the Sorbonne to study mathematics. It's really unusual for creative people to go that route. The only other artist mathematician, well, there are two that I can think of off the top of my head, the most famous being Leonardo da Vinci, the second being M.C. Escher, it's really unusual to have someone who has that left-right brain connection. 
But Bourgeois loved mathematics because she found it very calming and soothing. It helped her with the multiple anxiety issues that she had. We're gonna talk about those quite a bit. It gave her peace of mind, she, she famously said. She loved studying the rules that nobody could change. Her mother died in 1932 and she had spent so much of her young life taking care of her mother. Her mother was ill most of the years that Bourgeois was growing up and that consumed a lot of her childhood. And when her mother died in 1932, she abruptly abandoned the study of mathematics and began studying art. Uh, I have no explanation of why that change happened, but it did. Um, and she met people like Fernand Leger, who informed her that she was a sculptor and not a painter, um, which she took to heart. She graduated from the Sorbonne in 1935. She opened a print shop next to her father's tapestry gallery and there she met uh, an American art professor named Robert Goldwater. They fell in love, married and moved to the United States. She had three sons, one of whom was adopted and the marriage lasted until Goldwater's death in 1973. She settled in New York City with Goldwater in 19- Can you register me, Heidi? Heidi, can you register me going forward for all of them? Thanks. Okay, bye. Hi. Hi, welcome. I'm not sure that is, but welcome to our class. We're studying Louise Bourgeois today. I'm just giving a brief bio of her life now. And we're up to when she's arrived in New York City. She began studying at the Art Students League of New York. She began producing sculptures and prints. Her first painting was a grid. Um, she loved working in the grid format because nothing can, she said, quote unquote, nothing can go wrong. Everything is complete. There is no room for anxiety. Everything has a place and everything is welcome. So this issue of anxiety was paramount in Bourgeois' life. Throughout her life, Bourgeois' work was created from revisiting her own troubled past as she found inspiration and temporary catharsis from her childhood years and the abuse she suffered from her father. Apparently her father was having an affair with her nanny. Um, which she was quite open about. And this was all during the period when she was caring for her ill mother. And this really affected Bourgeois deeply and negatively uh, throughout her adolescence. And her, she was only 22 when her mother died. So um, she was quite young when all of this was happening to her. In 1954, Bourgeois joined the American Abstract Artists Group and among her contemporaries were Barnett Newman, Ad Reinhardt, Willem de Kooning, Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock. And the only reason I mention that is because her work is so incredibly different from the New York abstract art scene. She completely diverged from doing what the male artists were doing. And I find that so really wonderfully independent and exciting about her work. And we're gonna talk more about that when we actually look at it. Now, she never called herself a feminist artist, but when we look at her work, I think you're gonna see that it is most de definitely feminist in nature. There's always reference to the female body or not always, but quite frequently reference to the female body in her work. There's also a lot of reference to sexuality and her troubled relationship with her own body and, and gender relationships, the relationship between men and women and the emotional impact of her troubled childhood. 
very interesting psychological layers in her work. And I hope you're gonna find them visually exciting. So later in life in 73, after her husband, Robert Goldwater died, she began teaching at Pratt Institute uh, the Cooper Union, Brooklyn College, and the New York Studio School of Drawing, Painting, and Sculpture. And she taught printmaking and sculpture. She had her first retrospective kind of late in 1982 at the Museum of Modern Art. And until that moment, she'd been admired by other artists, but not been highly acclaimed. But after that, she really gained in status in the art world. She revealed at that time that her sculpture was primarily autobiographical. And again, she shared with the world that she was obsessively reliving the trauma of discovering as a child that her English governess was also her father's mistress. Sorry, not her nanny, her English governess. Can't imagine how upsetting that must have been. And this is interesting, and it's the last thing I'm going to talk about. In 2010, in the last year of her life, Bourgeois used her art to speak up for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender equality. She created the piece I Do, depicting two flowers growing from one stem to benefit the nonprofit organization Freedom to Marry. Bourgeois has said everyone should have the right to marry, to make a commitment to love someone forever is a beautiful thing. Bourgeois had a history of activism on behalf of LGBTQ equality, having created artwork for the AIDS activist organization ACT UP in 1993. So I had not known that. Not only was she a very active artist her whole life, but she was also an artist activist. Any thoughts or ideas that you'd like to add to the discussion on bourgeois? Anybody else, a follower or fan? If not, let's move on to her work. Well, we have a big group today. Welcome everybody. Okay, let's take a look at some of her work. I want to look first at some of her installations. And then we're going to look at some of her drawings. And then I'm going to give you some of the options you have to create your own pieces today. We should look at this one first. Okay. Anybody able to see this? Yes. See if I can make it bigger. All right, so this is part of a series of pieces that Bourgeois made. Those of you who have already started working, you might want to look up for a second, although I know some of you are very familiar with Bourgeois work. Um, so this is a piece made with plaster. And it's part of a series called Femme Maison. And many people, if you read psychological literature, many people think of the human, the female body in particular as a house and that parts of the female body are rooms in the house. And Bourgeois seems to have adopted that in the iconography of her work and literally in many of her pieces, she's making the woman the house, quite literally. Uh, 
I often her work leaves me completely speechless. I have to say, I love this piece. Any thoughts from any of you? It's really hard for me to understand why she rejected the description feminist artist or the title feminist artist. Lucy oh. Lepard, the great art historian, feminist art historian called her a feminist. Sorry, who, who was talking, Heather? It's Lauren, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Lauren. Um, I really liked this piece a lot. And um, I, I think one of the reasons why she did not want to be called a feminist was because she she called herself woman, you know, like we as women shouldn't have to call ourselves feminists um, in her eyes. And I really liked this piece a lot because I grew up with Alice in Wonderland. I think a lot of us did and spent a lot of time. Actually, I was going to do something um, regarding the one from Central Park today, but I really liked this because it immediately drew me to when Alice is so big and the the white rabbit's house and she's just completely encompassing it. And um, so that's what I had initially thought of, but I thought it was a really cool take on housewife, which is what that the literal translation is for this. And also, she seems to either have no head or replace the head with something on all of her um, she's sculptures. Just, yeah, she's yeah. Just it with the house. Right, exactly. Basically. And that it is a mindset, I think. Um, I think any career is, you know, but just in that, I don't know, this is very cool. I don't want to say too much. I always, I always take too much time, but um, I just, I, I really love this piece. And, um, and that's my bit. That's my two cents. <laughs> Lauren, and we appreciate your comments. Um, I'd like to say something. Um, it's Karen. I, I don't Karen. know how to get. I don't know how to get myself back on the screen, but um, I'm the flowers there. Um, I think that uh, she's an artist. She's not a feminist artist, and um, it, the art is about the viewer, what the viewer sees. And anyway, that that's what I think. I know. Um, of uh, someone who wrote a review um, of um, Pauline Kael's um, work and the movie um, critic. And he, he wrote a letter to her and she wrote back to him and said that she's the only one who reviewed anything of hers um, and without referring to her as a, as a female critic. And um, she's a, she's a, an art critic, a, a movie critic. Yes. And I think I, I think I would feel the same way. Okay. Does that make sense? It certainly does. I think to refer to yourself as a feminist artist limits your audience and she didn't want that to happen. She may have had leanings that way, but it, she didn't want to be pigeonholed. It's, see, this is always an interesting topic for me. I'm proud to call myself a feminist artist. So am I. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Quite all right. All right, let's look at another piece. One, I would like to say one thing about this piece. I love that it's all white. I love the shadows that it casts, the shadows on the figure itself, the beauty of the female form contrasted with the cubic geometric shape of the house is a fantastic contrast to me. And I love the smooth quality of this piece. Liz, really, really I, love that. Yeah. I think that, I think that this person is, is pregnant in this statue, in this sculpture. She looks pregnant. Okay. Could just be. From, just from my years of OBGYN, uh. you know. And the arch of her lower back yes. leads me to believe, too, that she probably is pregnant. Hadn't even thought about that. Wow. Good observation. Look how tiny her feet are, though. Doesn't that seem a little bit out of proportion? But I'm not even sure why I noticed that. I kind of like the delicate 
stunted quality of her feet. All right, let's look at something else. Smaller. I have many pictures, so bear with me, please, everybody. Find something slightly different. Yeah, here we go. Some of her, I guess I should give A word of caution, some of her pieces are a little disturbing. Everybody able to see this one? Yep. Okay. This one's very disturbing. Um, this one is part of a series called The Destruction of the Father. Knowing her family history, her past, her psychological issues, um, you get it, I'm sure. So it is extremely violent. She's getting her point across. But it does appear as if the female is the one being destroyed. I'm not sure of the materials in this one. I think this one is fabric. She made many, many dolls, life-size and smaller dolls that she stitched and stuffed. In fact, I'm gonna stop the share on this one quickly because I wanna show you one of those. Liz, do we know what this piece is that's sticking out of the body of the neck? It's a giant like scissor or something cutting tool that I think she's created. Okay. It's like a Thank cross you. between a saw and a machete and clippers. Looks like a Swiss army knife. Or a knife, yeah, with it, multiple yeah. blades. Yep. Something she's invented. But I'm almost positive this is fabric. You can see the seams. All right, so let, that's too troubling. Let's try something else. Yeah, love this one. Should have shown this one, not, not the other one. I don't know, did any of you go to see the doll show that I curated? I think it was maybe three years ago. There was an artist who did work very similar to this. She was great. All right, so these are fabric. And these are, you can see these are sexual reference. These are anatomically correct dolls and they are fabric stuffed dolls that she stitches. Um, they're so interesting. They're two-headed, facing in two different directions, hugging each other and obviously having intercourse. I hope are these life-size? Sorry to interrupt you. These are actually small. They're inside a box. I hope this is okay to show on a library recording. It looks like the, the facades of Indian temples. Ah, very interesting because they're so crowded together. Yeah. Oh, sexual activity. That, that's and yes, the sexual activity. But this one compared to the others is quite joyous and even the expressions, if you can see the expression on this doll's face, he looks completely ecstatic. He or she, I'm not sure the gender. I love, again, the tender little feet. All 
I love the way all of them are intertwined. Yeah, the way they fit together. And the duality that is posed in the two-headed beings. But everyone looks like they're having a good time. As she said, love is a beautiful thing. What was that final quote? To commit for life is a wonderful thing, I think she said. I can't find it now. Oh, Lily made it. Oh, let's leave this up. I want Lily to see it. All right, so we're now, we're gonna look at some of her drawings. I think you get a sense of the type of, she also worked in wood, in metal. She did a series of installations where she used old doors, where she actually created closets and, and rooms. They, they were really wonderful psychological study. And there was a great show also at the Guggenheim, a huge retrospective of her work. Gosh, it might even have been 10 years ago. What about the spiders? Yeah, we're getting to that. Oh, we could look at, I think I do have one of the sculptures. Yes. Okay, we'll look at that next. Thank you. I almost forgot. Who is that? Nomi, did you say spiders? Thank you for reminding me. And the spiders are really emblematic of her work. So thank you for the reminder. Bourgeois is emblematic or most famous for enormous sculptures of spiders that she made. And they really represent and symbolize everything that she was trying to convey in so many ways, because spiders have a duality. They have this horrific meaning for a lot of people. There are many people who have arachnophobia and are terrified of spiders. I believe really for unfound reasons, but that's a, a, a discussion for another day. But they also symbolize motherhood. Spiders are devoted mothers and Bourgeois was so connected to her mother and so devoted to her mother and loved her mother. And even though her mother was so ill, she claims her mother was the greatest mother on earth. Spiders spin webs in order to catch food to feed their mother. So she was deeply connected to the whole idea of spider motherhood. She was a fabric person who wove and stitched just like spider mothers do. And she made these pieces about spiders. For me, they are not the works that she made that appeal to me most but she made a lot of them. Can I um, ask you? Um, sure. Uh, I, I love the spiders, but have, were they ever, do you know if they were ever displayed uh, um, outside um, in the city? Sometimes they, uh, in front of Rockefeller Center, for instance, they have, uh, they had a, a Coons huge thing. Yes. It, Bourgeois, I don't remember where. There was one definitely in the lobby of the Guggenheim, um, in the main rotunda at the Guggenheim. Was there one outside in New York City? I'm sure there was. Where? I don't remember. Lauren, maybe you could do a little research for us. <laughs> you got it. What, what is the question? If where they, one of Bourgeois spiders was ever um, on view exhibited outside in Manhattan anywhere. I'll take a look. Thank you. There might have been a small one outside the Guggenheim when she had a retrospective. But good question, Karen. You love them. Why do you like them so much, Karen? Um, I just love, oh, I just lost the picture. Um, <laughs> I, I stopped the share. Oh, you did? Uh, oh. Um, 
uh, I just love the um, the um, the structure. The uh, here's another the little. It's very. Um, it, there are a lot of little little pieces put together. It seems, and I just think they look very um, uh, striking. They are striking. Yes, they're very powerful. In 2011, um, the spider sculpture was in Rockefeller Plaza. Oh. Awesome, thank you. No problem. So here is a spider drawing by Bourgeois. And I wanna show you a few of her drawings before we get to work because I wanna give you some choices about what you can create today. And drawing is one of the options one of the routes you can go in your own creative work today. She tended to work in her drawings very quickly. They have for me a kind of childlike quality. Again, her work for her is therapeutic. I don't know if she went through psychotherapy herself or if she just used her art to help her work through her personal problems. I don't have any information on that. I believe she did. That's what it said in the Jewish Museum current exhibition, where she called herself the daughter of Freud. She was mm -hmm. definitely very uh, literate in psychology. And she went for psychotherapy herself, or she studied? Both, I believe. OK. Thank you, Nomi. All right, let's look at a couple more, maybe one more drawing. What time is it? Oh, hold on a minute, everybody. Okay. I want to show you that she had a range. Oh, I do so love this drawing. This is another one of her drawings. She was in love with line, very simple. Reminds me, it just hit me, reminds me of Keith Haring. Very strong, but with that kind of childlike simple quality to it. For me, a kind of mix between joyfulness and sadness at the same time. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, hi, Liz. It's Jane. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I I really appreciate the, the uh, simplicity of a single line drawing like this. I think it's, it just um, demonstrates mastery in a way that other, other things don't speak quite as strongly to me. Yes. Um, and this particular drawing made me, when I saw it larger, I saw it in the, in the, in the images you shared on email. But when I saw it bigger, I, I thought of this uh, cartoonist, Bill Spira. It looked like his self-portrait, except that um, it was, it's clear that this is, a, this is a woman or a girl. And uh, his is obviously um, a male. So I thought that was interesting as well, because the simple lines convey so much her mood and her gender or her you know her born gender <laughs> i don't want to get too fancy here so yeah i love that i love it it's very pure and clear 
Nice, Jane. And another couple of artists who come to mind who also have this purity of line are Matisse and Picasso. So I put her in that category. Another female artist would be Kiki Smith. Very few lines to convey the message. Just a few lines needed to get the message across. And that does show a skill and a mastery that most artists don't have. Okay, one more. I promise. Love this one. I just want to show you the kind of range that she has in her work. Because I, I think that that shows you the kinds of options that you have. I'm gonna shrink this one a little because it's so blurry. Guy right, domesticity, she was always involved with things that you find around the home or the studio. Here's the tool she probably used in her studio. This is forceps, really an important tool for a doll maker for stuffing the doll. A lot of these, I would think a tapestry person would need large scissors and other things. I just love that she did it in red and that she took the time to look at everyday objects to create art. All right. I think we've done enough looking and sharing. Any last minute thoughts or ideas before I give us our equipment list and our assignment? All right. The main concept for today is nostalgia and memories. So I would suggest to you find a love object from the past. I brought out my doll Hazel again. Look for something that reminds you of your childhood. It could be a photograph. It could be an object like my doll Hazel. Um, it could be a, a smell, something that's going to trigger memories for you. And they don't have to be sad memories like bourgeois. It doesn't have to be memories fraught with trauma, but it could be happy memories. And I'm inviting you to create a drawing, a painting, or a sculpture that evokes or shows some of that memory. So for example, one avenue I could take is a drawing or painting of Hazel, which I would love to do. Another direction I could go in is something I started working on last night. I frequently involve myself in stuffing and wrapping things. This is a New York Times delivery bag stuffed with other plastic bags. And I have started wrapping it. I don't know why this gives me a lot of pleasure and reminds me of my childhood. But I'm thinking I might create a sculpture just using plastic bags and twine. So I invite you to look around your space, wherever you are, your home, your studio, and start touching things, start moving things around and see if it starts to inspire you to create something. You could do a collage. 
Maybe you have some old drawings that you did. Maybe you have some old drawings that if you're lucky enough to have children, children made when they were younger that they've abandoned and left at your house. Maybe you're a teacher and you have some old drawings left over from your teaching days or you're still teaching and you have stuff left over. Any questions? So this is a challenging assignment, but I think it's gonna be fun. You can even remember when we were doing the combines, when we were looking at Robert Rauschenberg, you might wanna continue working with your combine, but redirect the, the basic idea towards a memory that you have of your childhood. I'm thinking about doing that. Remember this box that I started with Rauschenberg? I'm thinking about adding to it. I never did get to finish it. If you kept it and you wanna keep working on it, that would be a great way to go on our celebration of Louise Bourgeois. So take a couple of minutes to gather up stuff. We have over an hour to work. So stuff in the chat box. Oh, Lauren put some cool stuff. Lauren, is this for everyone? Sure, you can share it. I just, from a photographer's point of view, I, um, I've always remembered the self port. I mean, it's not a self portrait, the portrait that Annie Leibovitz did of her. And it's just got this amazing texture and the behind the scenes on the shoot was um, she, she was waiting for her um, assistant to set up the lights and things and ended up just taking this shot and felt like it was a wrap. She took this shot as a test shoot and I just, I love it. I just, I love this shot. So I thought I'd share that. I'm not sure how to share it with everyone from here. Could you do that? Sure. Wait, let me see if I can change it from you to everyone. Should be in the chat box. It's quite a link, but uh, <laughs> it'll get you there. It's an enormous, I did copy it. Now, how do I paste it? Let's see, edit. I, it should be in the chat box for everybody. Oh, I did it, I did it. Well done. I'm so proud of myself, but now how do I send it? I hit return. Yes, ma'am. And there you go. Oh, I sent it. Okay, so <laughs> take a minute, everyone. Lauren sent us a picture of um, Louise Bourgeois taken by the great photographer, Franny Leibowitz. And we just click on it. We won't lose the Zoom if we click on the link, right? No. no it that was a resounding no. <laughs> Keep our fingers crossed. I'm clicking. Oh my. Isn't that beautiful? So beautiful. I mean, her hand is just as, you know, stunning, I feel, as the, the face and the expression. I, and show just... you, I did not show you the sculptures and drawings she did of hands, in fact. She was obsessed with hands for quite a while um i like those okay now how do i get back to my zoom screen it should be in the upper left hand corner of your screen and you can you know click on zoom should and is are two different things <laughs> Can try the back button. Or minimize the web page and then your Zoom meeting should be there on your screen. Here's I'm glad that that works. Sorry. I'm in post attendee Zoom. Annie Leibowitz portrait. If I X out the portrait, will I be back in Zoom? I believe so. 
Let's try that. Nope. I still have everybody else's picture. I just don't have me. Hmm. The view button in the top right corner of the screen, it's like, it's got a little image and it says view. If you click that, maybe you're off of speaker view. Should I click on video settings? Share screen. Well, as I don't know if it matters, this is Dina, but we can see you and you can see us. Oh, you can see me. That's good then. That's all that matters. I have, I have the chat box. I have pictures of you. I just don't have the main screen with me on it anymore. Active speak, switch to active uh, speaker. Do you have that anywhere on your screen? No, it's not weird. I did something weird. That's right. Ask to start video. Well, you guys keep working. I'm going to play with this. Maybe I can hit the back. Arrow, no. Nope. Video, video. Seven. Oh, here I am. There we go. Hello, me. <laughs> Except I'm not big. Oh, I can touch up my appearance. I managed to get in the settings so I can, oh, okay, here we go. I'm back. I don't know how that happened. Oh, Margo, I have to readmit you. I was gonna try and help you from my computer with getting you back into your screen. Oh, thank you. So you're the one who got me back in? Thank you. I'm not sure what I did. Figured if I you needed to admit me, that would help. <laughs> well, it worked. Whatever you did worked. And welcome back. So I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I have an allergy thing still going on. I'm, I'm going to keep working on whatever this is going to be because it's giving me pleasure. And it does not matter what you are doing, whether you've opted for painting or drawing or sculpture, whatever feels right today. Remember Bourgeois' belief that art is therapy. It's so in keeping with what we're all going through right now. I couldn't have picked a better artist if I tried, if I do say so myself.
do what feels good today. That's my goal for all of you. I guess I should make a side note. You don't have to self-analyze <laughs> while you're doing this. As long as it feels good, <laughs> it's all right. I don't know if you can actually see what I'm doing. It's a kind of anthropomorphic, it's a little bit sexy, I think. Feel to it. Don't feel jealous, Hazel. It's okay. I think this is going to be some kind of hanging installation. more plastic bags and endless supply.
if you are sculpting, do think about the materials that you're using. I'm really enjoying using the scratchy kind of hairy twine in juxtaposition with the smooth, slippery plastic of the bags. It just feels nice. I also like the contrast between the softness and then the tightness of the way I'm wrapping it, the softness of the bags and the tightness of the way I'm wrapping it. You can use anything. I, I have a, an artist friend who uses old empty prescription pill bottles to create amazing sculpture. Look at everyday things in new ways. And I know you got a variety of things in your grab and go bags for today. So definitely explore what you can do with them. Margo, you got blocks of wood. Maybe everyone did. They might be useful for today as well. about adding a doll to this.
Everybody good? Everybody's busy.
So I've clipped mine to the easel. You can kind of see the direction I'm going in. I don't know, maybe I'm onto something. Worth exploring. Still have, oh, 30 minutes to go. In the dark in here today, so I don't even know if you can see this. It's definitely expanding. Try some different colored plastic bags.
I'm assuming we're doing well. Most of you are off camera. Those of you I can see are really focused. Yay, yay, yay. As always, you can always ask questions in the chat or unmute.
So this is how my sculpture is growing. It's nice and squishy. <laughs> so much fun. I hope you are too. I say that every class, I think, but this one is particularly fun for me. Oh, and everybody look in the chat box. Heidi has put in uh, the name of the artist for Dina Dracia's next lecture, Charles DeMuth, who is really very interesting artist, August 10th at 11 a.m., 11 to 12. So you do have to register for that lecture. And Dina is just an awesome lecturer. I recommend her highly. What time? We have about 10, 12 minutes till sharing. And I'll tell you who we're gonna look at next week.
I'm going to stop for now. I love my piece. You can see it growing wall size. But I'm going to stop for now. Get ready for sharing. More minutes, everyone.
seven to eight. All right, everybody. Oh, I gave you extra time. Sorry to interrupt and stop you in the creative process. I hate doing that. But first, I want to announce our next artist will be Matisse. And Matisse, for those of you who've done other lessons with me, should be a name that you're familiar with. Matisse was a French artist, and he was one of the founders of the Fauve art movement. And the Fauvist, Fauve in French means beast. They were given that nickname because they use wild and crazy colors. So at the beginning of class, we're gonna go over color theory and color mixing. And then our assignment will be to create your own interior landscape. In other words, I'm gonna invite you to paint an interesting corner of your room. Or you could create a mini still life in your room and do a painting of that. I'm going to ask you to do it in unusual fauve style colors. And we're gonna talk more about that next week. Feel free to start researching Matisse and the fauves. I put Matisse in the chat box. I'm gonna write it again, Matisse. And the movement he was part of was called the Fauvist Movement of Art. Villard, as we say in France, long live art. All right, who's up for sharing today? I shared mine. I had so much fun using junk. Garbage and creating something brand new from it. SD, you've got a big grin on your face. You want to share? Yes, maybe. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Where are we? I, I started all kinds of things, but I didn't finish. And That's okay. This is the one. Oh, cider. Oh, fabulous. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. And oh, I saw the behind came even nicer. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you literally were inspired by her images. I didn't. Yeah, and this is the other one I started to sew. I started to sew uh, the face thing. I love it. Don't you love sewing on paper? It is not easy, but yes, I do. I just love the sound it makes. That They are both great. The black against the white is so cool. Thank you. Love your t-shirt. 
I'll share. Who is that? Who's that? Thanks. Thanks, SD. Keep Stephanie. Who said that? Who said okay. that? Share? Margo? Can you see me? I, I don't know who asked to share. You have to identify yourself. Oh, it's Stephanie. Stephanie, sorry, I'm gonna find you. There you are. Here. Okay, so this is ah this is a picture of me. Can you see? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is a picture of me when I was a little girl in camp. Love it. Love and it. I was always fascinated by it. So this is what I did. Oh, it's great. Great. Well, <laughs> Oh, it's it was great. fun. It was really fun. I I was thinking of doing like wool, you know, in the hair and stuff like that, and some maybe try it, try it, try it. it. Yeah, but you know, I I, I really haven't drawn. <laughs> this is new to me. I think so. it's wonderful. I think she's. I mean, so there funny. there are specific technical things I could tell you, but I don't want you to touch this drawing. I think it's charming and wonderful. I would love to see you do more with wool. I would love to see you do something in the background. Right. All this white space is crying out for something. Okay. It's marvelous. I, just, I put the houses in last because there was nothing um, in the uh, original. Are those, are those the cabins just, you lived in at camp? Yeah, those are little bunks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they were like really cute, little cute bunks. Maybe you could do something more with the trees if you have some kind of green fabric. Oh, what a great on. idea. Great. Yeah. Go for it. And something blue for the sky. Right. My mother never knew what to do with my hair. I had really, really, really curly hair. You are a lucky, lucky camper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a happy camper. Give me some of that hair. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. That's terrific. Thanks. It was fun. I'm so glad you had fun. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, you're welcome. Thank we you. Have, we only have a few minutes left. Who else wants to share? Susan? Yeah. Me okay, too. cool. Thank you, Stephanie. Yo, you're welcome. Mine is a little oh. scary. <laughs> Don't be scared. Um, this <laughs> is a... <laughs> This is a picture of me, it's a copy and I colored it. This was something I made for my mother without the, the shrunken head. And uh, when she <laughs> passed away, I got it back. My happy place was the Brooklyn Museum. My father used to take me there all the time. And every time I was there, I bought a shrunken head. My mother, however, probably threw them all out. So. <laughs> but she kept your artwork. Well, no, I mean, she kept this. I made this as an adult, this little frame. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah, she she did keep my artwork. I have a little ashtray I made in kindergarten in my house here. Mm -hmm. But um, so, you know, I had to do, it's not completely finished yet, but that's me smiling and my shrunken head, one of them that I drew on top. So that's my, my little. <laughs> here's, here's a compositional suggestion. Mm -hmm. I feel a need for something solid behind your head. Something okay. that will, will connect you to the shrunken head portion. Okay. So at the moment, all the separate items are floating away from each other. You mm -hmm. need something solid in the background to pull the different small things together to make okay. it a, a cohesive composition. Okay. <laughs> I would know that that was you. We have the same haircut as children, just saying. I know, right? I, that was always have the, I have the same photograph with the bull haircut yep. as a child. And the, yep. that kind of Peter Pan collar, white collar oh, in my dress. Yeah, this, this was a kindergarten picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's, I have a kindergarten picture. Just like, <laughs> I love it. <coughs> okay. All right, thanks, okay. Susan. Anyone else? Jane, Pat, Pat, you haven't shared in a while. Yay. Oh, you do, you have to get rid of the background. Uh, okay, let me see how I can do it. Um, 
Sorry, thank you for waiting. I'm working on a photograph. Um, it's a family trip that I took a lot with my family on a boat. Awesome. Oh. So, and then in the memory, I did this sketches. Ah. Still working on it, but I love sketching all my family. They're very close. Even though we're apart, I miss them a lot. <laughs> wow, it's awesome. Mm. Will you show us next week when you're done, please? Sure. Great line work, Pat. Thank you. Are you going to do it in color or leave it black and white? Uh, there's one interesting thing. It's back then, everyone, it's kind of holding a can of soda drink. That probably something I might want to emphasize on. So what well, depends. I keep okay. that. I'm just having that idea, but I'm not sure yet. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be a tough decision when you're finished with the drawing. I, I kind of like it black and white. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy. Keep keep enjoying. So Liz, I can um, I can show you what I worked on last okay. week. Thank you, Pat. You're welcome. Jane is next. Okay. So a while ago, I had done this um, sketch. I don't remember the artist, but, mm -hmm. but there was a grid, and I do I mean, intend to finish this. Yeah. Um, since then, the the plant that I was drawing had not only one, but two incredible blooms. And so wow. it's really, it's just the most extraordinary little bloom. So last week I, uh, I drew just the bloom, um, intending to add it to the drawing. So I'll do kind of a combination um, collage when it's done nice. and I didn't even worry about like scale I you know if it's scaled up it doesn't matter I can add it in because the, the point was this this bloom um, I was using the shading technique but I wasn't listening so carefully so it wasn't until you mentioned again to avoid drawing lines that I I got it and um so I still have some work to do on it, but I'm really enjoying capturing this bloom before she's gone. <laughs> she's so she's so unusual, and I think it only happens once a year. So wow, I don't know how it was that I got two. Yeah, my one suggestion with your shading, blend, 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 blend. Yeah, I still have quite a bit. Have some to very do. harsh harsh edges. Yes, yeah. But it's a beautiful, beautiful drawing. Thank you. Capture, capture. You have one minute left. Heather. Yay. Oh, good. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's successful, but um, I tried doing one of her pieces. Yes. And the figurative. I love the colors. And then there's like Again, you have this terrible glare. I oh, know. Oh, it's is it a spider? Yes. Uh, with jewelry uh, pieces for the legs. Oh, it's really nice. Yeah, it's all right, but um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love I love how the texture is hidden, kind it's, of. It's hard to see the color. Yeah, it's hard to see the detail, which it's is a little bit more intense. <laughs> I, I like how the texture is kind of subtle and recessed. It's not, yeah. not sticking out, protruding a lot. I like that. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's there, but it's not, it, it's not really. It, keep, it, keep working it, on it. Keep working it, on it. Love the colors. Mm. All right. Thank you, Heather. Lizzie? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so my mother's family was all from New Bedford, Massachusetts, which was a whaling town. Yes, it was. So I know mother, that New Bedford. Ah, 
So my mother was born like 1919. So she always used to say when she was young, they used to have these big barrels outside downtown with all these well bones, uh, teeth and stuff in it. So I have this one from when my mother was young. So anyhow, I did a collage, which I never did before, but. <laughs> so this, wow. this is um, by the library in New Bedford. We, as kids, my fam, my brothers and sisters, we used to climb on that statue all the time. And then I just tied in the theory of capturing that whalebone and going from ocean to land and, and sort of the circle. This is a real piece of twine here or you? Yeah. yeah. I like how you're drawing everything together, relating all the shapes and things that you use, you're pulling them together. Mm. I and love this, how this is a shoelace <laughs> to define the ocean. I like how even the photograph casts a shadow on mm. the image. Well, I didn't glue it all the way down to have a little dimension. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't glue it flat. Mm. If you're willing, it, it would damage the photograph a little, but I would extend some of the yellow background if mm -hmm. you can color the photograph mm. to soften the edges of the photograph a bit and work it into the composition of the painting. Mm. Yeah, that's a good idea. That, that might even add to you know, working it into the overall picture. Mm. Oh, how cool. We have to talk about whaling one day. I used to <laughs> teach a science program called Voyage of the Mimi, which is all about whaling. Ah. I love the humpback whale. I think it's the most magnificent creature on earth. Mm. Well, did you hear that story with the guy in, uh, where was he? Oh, in um, Providence, I think I got <laughs> swallowed by the whale. <laughs> Total BS. You should excuse me. It's impossible. All right. Actually, I don't know where Heidi is. It's time for us to stop, but let's, we still, I'm willing. I'm here. I'm here. Oh. Oh. I put all the information for Dina's. Uh, yeah, I shared that program. with everyone. I shared that with everyone. Mm -hmm. I also, uh, last minute plug for me. The information about the interview, the, the discussion with me at the Hoboken Historical Museum is tomorrow night from 7 to 8 p.m. It'll be on the museum's YouTube channel, Twitter, and Facebook.